Well, good morning, Renovation. How are we doing on this Labor Day weekend? I see a few of you chose to stay in town, so that's exciting, and I know we have many more joining us online. Welcome to you as well this morning. Uh, my name's Josiah. Normally, I'm with the band, but thank you this morning, Stuart, for leading us. And if I can give just a quick shameless plug, I don't want to embarrass him, but Stuart, the Lord has laid some songs on his heart lately, and he the first one called Freedom released this last week on YouTube and other streaming platforms. So I don't have any shame in just encouraging you to go give it a listen, be encouraged, and support him in the process. So thanks, brother. Um, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn or tap to Matthew chapter 11. And I grew up, like, since I got the, my first Casio keyboard when I was a kid, I've been in bands. And I've probably had more band names than actual bands that I've been in. Um, but that's part of the fun, right, of coming up with a new, And I've always been intrigued by these band names that make you think like Audio Adrenaline or Vertical Horizon. Like, I don't even know what that means. But it's just intriguing, you know. It gets the people going. So in high school, I was in a band called Weary. <laughs> like, that's kind of depressing. I'm like, well, it was the 90s. That's kind of the point, you know. Grunge was king. You know, rest in peace, Kurt Cobain. But, I mean, it was kind of cool to be depressing. But since we were a Christian band, you know, it was like you could be depressing on the outside, but secretly it was pointing to a Bible verse, you know. One of those things. And this is the Bible verse that we pick up in Matthew 11, starting in verse 28. The words of Jesus. In the NIV, it says this. Come to me, all you who are what? Ah, there it is. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And I love the, the way that Eugene Peterson paraphrases these same verses. In the message, he says, Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Does anyone this morning want to learn how to live a little bit more freely and lightly? So this morning for a moment, and it may seem odd timing with the climate that we're in, but I'd like to speak just for a moment on slowing down. It's a theme that God's been working in my and Michelle's life over the last several weeks. And, uh, you know, for some of you, you may feel like, how could life possibly slow down anymore? I've already been quarantined for several months. I don't get to see any of my friends. The movie theaters aren't open. What am I supposed to do with my life? Some of you this morning may actually have found yourself feeling bored at some point in the last few months. And if that's you... You have permission just to zone out for the next 30 seconds, okay? But then you'll want to get your notes ready to go. Um, but for some of us, before COVID hit, we were already running at a wild, hurried pace. And once it hit, things only escalated. I know for me, that first week when we switched from meeting in person to online only, and I realized we don't have internet in this building, we don't have hardware for broadcasting. We don't have an online church platform. Where do you even find one of those? And, and so my hours for those first probably three, four weeks easily doubled. You know, it just got more intense. And as if that wasn't hectic enough, you know, in that time frame, my wife and I decided to get married because, you know, it's only a little life change, nothing major. <laughs> So we got married with a 13 hours notice in the, after following one of the live streams on a Sunday morning. And then, you know, 2020 surprise, within a month we found out, hey, we're pregnant. <laughs> so <laughs> we're expecting a little baby boy come January. Um, yeah, thanks. You know, but no big life changes. So if you have any baby suggestion names, please keep them to yourself. Uh, we are, we're doing all right here. Um, but, you know, some of you, like me, you have a never-ending list of to-do items. There are things that are marked urgent that seem they're always fighting for our attention. Or maybe you don't have specific activities, but somehow you live in a state of feeling busy. I'm amazed at how many psychiatrists are diagnosing five- and six-year-olds with 
with clinical depression these days. You wonder what on earth would a five and six year old have to be depressed about? But as we find out, as we have learned in the last several years, a lot of it's from overstimulation. Growing up in these formidable years with a screen in front of their face that's causing them to feel depressed. So even little kids can feel hurried. There's a sense of something that should be happening and there's this restlessness. Um, I'm going to skip a whole bunch of stuff, John. And because I, I kind of want to touch on, before we can slow down, I want to say, how did we get into this state? Because when you look in the, in the garden, you see Adam and Eve walked with God. There wasn't a hurry to it. In fact, Jesus himself was never in a hurry. A few weeks ago, we were at a virtual uh, leadership summit and heard Pastor Michael Todd. He said, you know, you realize that Jesus, the most famous, the most influential, the most important person who ever lived, accomplished everything the Father had set out for him in three years. And you never saw him running to his next appointment. In fact, quite the opposite. Some, what about Lazarus? Jesus got there too late. Literally a life or death situation. And the word was sent ahead, Jesus, come quick, he's dying. Only you can save him. But Jesus wasn't in a hurry and he got there too late and Lazarus was already dead. And he wept. But you see, Jesus knew something that they didn't because he rose Lazarus from the dead. And I wonder for some of us this morning, if we miss out on the miracles that Jesus may want to do in our obedience because we are too busy trying to take things into our own hands. John Mark Comer, in his book, The Ruthless Elimination, where's Jeff? <laughs> the Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Okay, yeah. In his book, he gives a brief, uh, what he calls like a history of hurry. How did we get here? And he starts with the sundial. I only saw one Old Testament reference to a sundial in my brief search but I realized it wasn't until the New Testament that you begin to see hours in terms of 60-minute intervals uh, even mentioned. It was the sixth hour. It was the ninth hour. You don't see that for most of human history. And so the sundial, and, and by 200 B.C., people were already, like, complaining about this new technology and how it was ruining society and it was ruining people's lives. And the, uh, the Roman playwright Plautus actually said this said, the gods confound the man who first found out how to distinguish ours. Confound him too who in this place set up a sundial to cut and hack my day so wretchedly into small portions. <laughs> so the next time you're running late, just remember that line. The gods confound the man. You can quote a little Plautus. So the sundial. Then in the 6th century, St. Benedict, he instituted seven times of prayer per day at the monastery. And so they used the sundial and little bells to notify the monks when it was time for these different prayer times. And they began responding to these alarms at given times. And by the 12th century, these Benedictine monks actually had created their own mechanical dial, or what we might call a Casio, a clock these days. But most historians would point to the year 1370 as the year that changed forever for the West, our perception of time. Because in 1370... In Cologne, Germany, which is a cool little town, I highly recommend visiting there sometime, they put in the first public clock tower. Now, you got to think why this was a massive thing, because before, before this time frame, time was natural. There was a rhythm in nature to time, and you would go to bed with the moon, and you would wake up with the sun, and in the summer, the days were longer and more busy, but in the winter, the days were shorter and more restful. But the clock brought with it artificial time. Now no longer are you sleeping and waking up when your body feels rested. You're waking up when your alarm goes off and the device is telling you it's time to be somewhere, it's time to do something. And it's far more efficient probably, I mean it was Germans, but you know, it's far more efficient, but I feel like in the process maybe we've lost some of our humanity. We've, we've become a little more machine. 1879, Thomas Edison invented Light bulb, allowing people to be able to stay up past dark. Well, they had candles. Well, whatever. You get the point, right? Allowing people to stay up past dark. Did you know that before the light bulb, the average person slept 11 hours a night? The average today for Americans, seven. 
No wonder we're always exhausted. And if you consider, depending on how you interpret scripture, that there's probably around 24,000 years of human history between Adam and Eve and today, that means for more than 99.9% of all human history, people probably slept 11 hours a day. But man, if we escalated things. The last hundred years or so, we've seen a whole multitude of what are called time-saving or labor-saving devices, everything from cars and planes to um, washing machines, dishwashers, programmable coffee makers, things that actually do save us time and save us energy. And the the trend was going so much that by the 60s, futurists were beginning to to try to figure out what were Americans specifically going to do with all of this extra free time that came up. And in one especially famous 1967 Senate subcommittee hearing, you may remember hearing something about this, um, but they actually predicted that by the year 1985, the average American would work no more than 22 hours a week, no more than 27 weeks per year, And they would have so much free time on their hands, they would not know what to do with themselves. I think we've managed to fill it in, don't you? (laughs) Then fast forward to 2007, a year on par with 1440. Anybody know what happened in 1440? A guy named Gutenberg invented the printing press, changing forever the way that we communicate, right? Right? Up to that point, communication was done either orally to one or to a small group of people, whoever could hear within the sound of your voice, or it was done through a handwritten copy of a letter or or a book or something like that. But now, suddenly, with the printing press, one person's words could be immortalized forever and distributed around the globe. And people were afraid of this technology, too, because it changed massive, mass communication forever. But... I don't know, if we hadn't had the printing press, we probably wouldn't have had the Reformation. The ability for for anybody to have the Bible in their language, in their hands, to read it for themselves. And so it brought great advantages. But 2007, what happened? Steve Jobs introduced the iPhone. 2007 was the year that Facebook suddenly opened up to anybody with an email address. 2007 was the year that a microblogging app called Twitter became its own independent platform. This was year one of the cloud, year one of the app store. In fact, 2007 is the official start date of the digital age. And again, signaling a massive shift in communication. It's a little dated now, but in his book, The Shallows, What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains, Nicholas Carr writes, and I think these words still pertain to us today. He says, what the net seems to be doing... The net is the internet, in case y'all don't remember the 90s. Sandra Bullock, (laughs) no? All right. What the net seems to be doing is chipping away at my capacity for for concentration and contemplation. Whether I'm online or not, my mind now expects to take in information the way the net distributes it, in a swiftly moving stream of particles. Once, I was a scuba diver in the sea of words. Now... I zip along the surface like a guy on a jet stream, a jet ski. And our attention span is dropping. In the year 2000, the average attention span in the US was 12 seconds. So it's not like we were working with a lot to begin with, right? By today, the average is eight seconds. Just for reference, a goldfish has a memory of about nine seconds. So we are losing to goldfish, friends. <laughs> And here's the thing, these devices, these services are designed to be addictive. If you know someone who plays Fortnite, you know this is the case. My sympathy is with you, by the way, for those who are not able to download season four on your smartphone this last week. Um, Maybe you're in the bored category earlier. (laughs) But they're supposed to be addictive. How many remember when Netflix rolled out the automatically play the next episode link? Remember that? You used to have, you, you, you would have to be feeling pretty lazy in order, it was a decision you had to make at the end of an episode whether you're going to advance to the next one to watch. Now it does it automatically. You have to go out of your way to stop it from automatically advancing to the next episode. And some of you may have binged just enough that at some point you've seen that alert pop up on the screen that said, after several episodes that says, hey, are you still watching? <laughs> you do a little walk of shame and you decide whether you're going to lean in and watch more or if you're going to get up and do something with your life. <laughs> And so the internet has provided all these things, and the smartphone in 2007 put this in our front pocket. 
A recent study found that the average smartphone user touches his or her phone 2,617 times per day for an average of two and a half hours spanning 26 sessions throughout the day. And for millennials, the numbers are nearly twice that. Another study found that just being in the same room as our phone, even if it's turned off, quote, will reduce someone's working memory and problem-solving skills, end quote. Translation, our smartphones are making us dumb. <laughs> but here's the thing. When you look at it, like the printing press, like the sundial, your smartphone, these devices, these services, they're just, they're just tools to be used, and they have the potential to do incredible good, Right? The problem for us, I think, becomes is when you become the tool in the hands of the device, in the hands of the service. So, as I mentioned, uh, I was married a few months ago. Well, I still am. My, my lovely wife is watching from Illinois. Hey, babe. <laughs> um, but, so I married a few months ago. Up to that point, my entire life, the only person I really had to worry about or care for was myself. I'm the only one I had to provide for. But I will say, something about becoming married and now becoming pregnant is I began to ask a few questions differently because I realized my life doesn't affect only me. I'm asking questions like, what kind of husband do I want to be? What kind of dad do I want to be? What, how do I qualify? What are the, the needs of my family? How do I distinguish those from wants? And how do I provide for those needs in a way that keeps me present and involved in their lives? Because like some of you, I, 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 you know, when I grew up, I remember so many of my friends' dads, like they provided well for their families. It, they provided the great vacations, the nice house, and so on and so forth, but so many of their dads were absent in their life, either physically, or by the time they got home, they were so exhausted from work that they were absent emotionally and unavailable. And so, Michelle and I were reading in the bathroom one night. So, she was soaking in the tub, not hot, okay, we're only doing warm water because she's pregnant, we're being responsible. We leave the door open so it doesn't get too humid in there. But she was soaking in the bathtub and I was sitting in a camping chair with my feet propped up on the toilet and I know you're thinking you guys are so romantic. And I was reading to her a book about the Sabbath. <laughs> And uh, it opened up a cool conversation for us about what it might look like for us to try our own Sabbath experiment together. And I'll share just a, a little bit of that in a moment. Um, but real quick, for those who maybe aren't familiar with the word Sabbath, it, it comes from the Hebrew word Shabbat, and it literally just means to stop. And commonly we refer to it as a day, a week, a 24-hour period every week that we stop to remember, to observe and we stop, on this day, we stop from working, we stop from wanting, we stop from worrying, we just stop. Where did the Sabbath come from? In the beginning, Genesis 1, God created the heavens and the earth, and after six days of creating the universe and the plants and the animals and, and humans, we pick up in Genesis 2, verse 2, this. It says, by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day. We're talking about why he blessed a day in a moment and made it holy because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. My friends, God rested. And somehow we have excuses, don't we? Well, you see, Josiah, I'm just an extrovert, and, and I like to stay busy, and I like, but God rested. Well, but my job is really demanding, and I love it, and maybe later when, but God rested. Like, well, yeah, but Josiah, I have young kids, and you don't understand this yet, but boy, you sure will, and, and they just don't stop moving. I don't have time. Maybe later when, but God rested, and in so doing, he set up. He built a rhythm into the DNA of creation. God worked for six, rested for one. This is the natural created order. This is not simply a biblical concept. This is not simply a theological concept. This is a universal truth for all of creation. Work and rest. And as uh, philosopher H.H. H. Farmer said, if you go against the grain of the universe, you get splinters. <laughs> and... It's interesting because I've been part of these conversations among Sabbath, about Sabbath with Dr. Dan for pushing 15 years now maybe. 
Um, and it's something that I have to constantly be reminded and challenged of because it's so easy to get wrapped up in all the things that are urgent that have to get done. And it's so easy to excuse, well, I can't really take a day this week, but maybe next week, or we'll see how things go. Did you realize that study after study have shown that there is zero correlation between hurry and productivity? In fact, some of my history buffs may remember during the French Revolution, the French actually tried to institute a 10-hour work week with the idea of increasing productivity. And what happened? Productivity tanked because that's not the way the universe works. In fact, scientists have actually found the number of hours per week that you can work with high levels of productivity before it starts tanking. You want to know what that number is? 50 hours or almost exactly six work days. In fact, the, it, the study went even further. It said that they, they found between 55 and 70 hours a week of work, you actually have zero productivity gains. You 15 hours further away from your family, but zero more productivity. Because that's not the way the universe works, and yet we try. So you wonder, well, then why don't more people take a Sabbath? You know, it's like we didn't know what we didn't know. Let me paint a picture. Dan Allender in his book, Sabbath, he says this, and I've only slightly edited it, being mindful there may be small children in the room. Um, but he says, the Sabbath is an invitation to enter delight. The Sabbath, when experienced as God intended, is the best day of the week. It is the day we anticipate on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and the day we remember on Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. Sabbath is the holy time where we feast, play, dance, sing, pray, laugh, tell stories, read, paint, walk, and watch creation in its fullness. Few people are willing to enter the Sabbath and sanctify it to make it holy because a full day of delight and joy is more than most people can bear in a lifetime, let alone a week. What an incredible thought. Why is the Sabbath full of joy and delight when we observe it the way that God intended? I think, for one, because the Sabbath is blessed. We read that in Genesis 2, that God blessed the Sabbath. And so God blessed animals, he blessed humans, and then he blessed the Sabbath. Why? I think because like animals and humans, the Sabbath has the same life-giving capacity to procreate, to give more life into the world. I found a medical study that was done recently that was surveying to find out who the happiest people groups were in the U.S., and right up near the top was a group of Christians called Seventh-day Adventists. And this is a group who are literally religious about the Sabbath, observing the Sabbath. And it's kind of a side product. These doctors were surprised to find that not only were they the happiest, but on average, they lived 10 years longer than other Americans. 10 years. If you do the math quickly, if you were to add up all of the potential missed Sabbaths over the course of a lifetime, it would add up to almost exactly 10 years. So when I say that Sabbath can be life-giving, it's not just rhetoric, right? In fact, if this study is to be believed, we could say statistically or even scientifically for every day that you Sabbath could be added on to you an elongated life, and yet people say, I'll have time to rest when I'm dead. Yeah, it's probably coming sooner than you think. Sabbath is not optional. Our choice is in whether Sabbath is going to be a delight or whether it's going to be a discipline. The land will get its rest. Number two, the Sabbath is holy. So in ancient times, gods were designated at places, right? Temples, shrines, a holy mountain. But now we find God not in a specific place, but in a day, in a time. For us, we find God not by a pilgrimage to Mecca or Stonehenge or wherever you want to go, um, but we find God when we take enough time to stop Shabbat and know that he is God, to experience him. So the Sabbath is blessed and holy. Real quick, this is just a few things what the Sabbath is not. Um, this is my definition, so don't hold me to this, but... <laughs> but I, I just feel a strong conviction that Sabbath is not a day off. It's not a day to do chores, because on a day off, you do chores. You, you run errands, you catch up on grocery shopping if necessary, you might 
do that, you know, start on the honeydew list or the home improvement projects that are waiting to be done. That's what happens on a day off, on a, on a Shabbat, on a Sabbath. We don't do that. It's not a day to plan out the rest of your week. If you have a doctor's appointment to schedule, make a note on the fridge, and the next day you can call and schedule that doctor's appointment. The Sabbath is a day of feasting, not fasting. <laughs> In fact, I love the differentiation. So in Exodus, we, it, Sabbath was a principle established from the beginning. It was an invitation. It was a gift created by God in the formation and order of the universe. And yet, by Exodus chapter 20, it had to become a command because people were neglecting this amazing gift. And in Exodus 20, verse 8, we read the commandment, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. By 11 chapters later, the verbiage changed a little to observe the Sabbath because it is holy. What kind of days do we observe? Holy days, holidays, right? Think about Christmas. Think about Christmas as, as a day that we observe. What do you do on Christmas? Not much, hopefully, right? Christmas is a day to enjoy, to spend with your family, to, to let the dishes pile up in the sink. It's fine. You can work on them the next day, right? But we observe the day, meaning we have preparations that go into it beforehand so that we can take that full day off. And a Sabbath is the same concept. Imagine a gift of having a Christmas 24 hours every week. I think it would change not only that day, but it would change the rest of our week too as we learn to live in step with God. Um, two things, and then I'm going to tell a little bit about what our experience has been here. Two principles that I think kind of guide what a Sabbath activity can be, and that's rest and worship. Is this activity qualified as rest, or does it count as worship? And worship, keep in mind, is not just necessarily singing songs or listening to worship music, but it could be engaging in a sacred pathway. Is it rest? Is it worship? So Michelle and I are three weeks into our little experiment of Sabbath, and here's what we've done. And then um, afterward, I'm going to try to give a few brief uh, other suggestions of things, but just so you get a gauge. We're three weeks in. So we found, at least for now, the most effective day for us to be able to unplug is Sunday at sundown until Monday at sundown. And so that is our Shabbat, our 24-hour period. And so Sunday at sundown... We turn off our phones, we unplug any device that's connected to the internet in the house, and they stay off for 24 hours. Some of you just got slightly stressed. <laughs> and, I, and I must say, when we first did it the first week, it was a little bit of an exercise of faith. <laughs> um, but boy, by Tuesday morning, we were sure looking forward to the next Sabbath. <laughs> um, so we turn off our phones, internet, set them aside. We don't want to see them for 24 hours. Um, some weeks we've gone to bed early, and we'll just talk in bed. Uh, one week we watched an old movie on DVD, if any of you remember what those are. Um, and then in the morning, ooh, we like to sleep in. The kind of sleep in where you don't just get up when you wake up the first time. You lay there for a while and see how long you can take before you might fall asleep again. You know? And then you stare at the ceiling for a while and then whatever it takes. Um, but we like to sleep in and then we like to make a breakfast feast. Now we're talking whatever the rest of your diet may be the rest of the week, but we're talking pancakes loaded with chocolate chips, eggs, whatever. We make a big spread and we enjoy a nice, slow breakfast. And then... We'll, we'll sit on the couch for, for a little while, and we'll just spend some time reading, reflecting on scripture, talking through things that, that stuck out to us, and then we'll spend some time praying together for you or for whatever the Lord puts on our, on our minds, and then we'll spend some time dreaming together. And then at whatever unhurried pace we feel like doing something else, we will. First week, we just spent a few hours floating in our little inflatable pool in the backyard, we didn't want to touch the bottom because it was nasty, um, but it's okay. It's like two feet deep, so you don't have to touch the ground other than to get in and out. Um, but we did that and just watched the trees, watched the birds and planes fly overhead. Um, a couple weeks ago, we thought, well, I've never tried painting anything, so why not take a stab at that? And uh, so we spent like five hours doing this one boring painting, and it's not finished, and who knows, we may never finish it, but that's not really the point. 
the point was finding time, I almost was going to say time well wasted, but I would just say it's time well rested. And there's something just relaxing about brush strokes and doing something together that didn't have to be finished. It wasn't a task. It was a privilege. It was a joy. Sometimes we'll read stories to each other, and fiction only, okay, because it's not about self-improvement in that regard on Sabbath. It's not about, you know, building my leadership capacity, which ironically you do when you rest. You build your leadership capacity to lead and to serve more so. Um, but it's not about getting your business improved on your day of rest. So we read fiction and we'll spend a few hours. We like to lay on the bed. I like to open the window so I can see the tree blowing the breeze outside because I'm a naturalist. Uh, so when she's reading, and then we'll flip and we'll take turns reading back and forth. We'll take extra naps because why not? We'll, uh, sometimes we'll play board games. We got this version of Monopoly that you can get usually three games done in about 20 minutes. It's really impressive. Um, so we'll do that. We'll listen to worship music, which we've had to figure out how to do without the internet since we're so used to Spotify. Um, I'll show you my cassette tape recorder thing uh, some other week, maybe. It's pretty fly. Um, and then we like to spend a long time preparing dinner. Sometimes I'll just sit in the kitchen with my guitar as we're waiting for stuff to, to sit or to bake or whatever the case is. But we just like to spend a long time, time that we wouldn't normally spend making dinner the rest of the week because the schedule doesn't permit. We like to spend a long time, and then we'll sit around, just have a candlelight dinner, slowly eat, and then we go for a walk closer to sundown around the neighborhood. And then by the time we get home, it's sundown. And uh, we get our phones, power them back on, and we slowly ease back into our digital lives. But we carry with us the Sabbath the rest of the week. It changes our, our perspective of the urgent. It gives us something to look forward to. Now... I've said this, and I realize some of you may feel like you don't have the luxury of a 24-hour period of rest in your life right now. And I don't understand what it's like to be a single mom working three jobs just trying to pay the rent, try to put a roof over your kids' heads. I don't know that. But I do believe with all my heart that this invitation to rest is for all. Come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So I asked earlier, who here would like to learn a little bit more how to live freely and lightly? I have a few life hacks, um, tech tips. These are just simple, probably silly ways. Feel free to ignore anything I say here in the next moment, but just ways throughout the rest of the week how you can you can slow down and in so doing, accomplish more. Number one, keep your phone off until after your morning quiet time. This is so hard. If the stats read right, 75% of us sleep with our phones next to our bed. And 90% of us, checking our phone is the first thing we do when we wake up in the morning. And before you get out of bed sometimes, you've already scanned the news headlines or social media. And I wonder, what if we didn't touch our phones until after we started the day with first things first, with our quiet time with God? It might set the platform for the whole day differently in the way that we see and engage the day. Number two, set times for email, if you use email. Now, pretty much every self-help writer, every efficiency expert has already said these next three things over and over again. Number one, do not have email on your phone. Number two, do not glance at it when you get a free moment in the elevator or in a boring meeting. Number three, do not answer random emails throughout the day. Rather, set a time to do email and stick to it. I remember years ago, um, when I started at a Crossroads, actually, I remember Ryan, who was my kind of supervisor, I guess, at the moment, um, I got a cell phone, and I mentioned something about, like, hey, you didn't reply to my text. And he reminded me gently, he says, you know, I got a cell phone for my convenience, not for yours to be able to get a hold of me whenever you want. <laughs> and I think that as we learn to set times that other people's expectations of us will become removed over time. Number three, set times and limits on social media. Again, if you do social media, 
this may be a bit of a, a, a challenge, but I would challenge you, turn off notifications and badges on all of the social media apps on your phone because it's relentless. The other day, Michelle and her sister, they posted on Aldi. It's like a German grocery store that's coming to the valley at the end of the year. What, what? But they have what's called an aisle of shame, where they have random miscellaneous things for sale, and we found these maternity leggings there. And so I picked up a pair for her and her sister, and they took a picture and posted it on the, the Aldi Facebook page. And within hours, they had like over 11,000 likes or something like this. Like, and so they're, both of their phones were just Bloop, 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 just, just notifications going wild. Um, and I think if we live, this again, it's back to like becoming a tool when your device is telling you, hey, look at me, look at me, look at me. But if we, if we set times rather than wait for the notification, say, okay, at these times, I'm going to check my phone and see if I've missed anything during the day. What a way to rest in the present, Right? Number four, this one's going to hurt too, limit or eliminate your TV, which obviously includes streaming services too, Netflix, YouTube, Hulu, Disney Plus, and so on. Um, the news, <laughs> if you watch the news. The average American watches over 2,700 hours of TV per year, and yet so many of them find themselves saying things like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't have time to fill in the blank because I was busy watching TV. They're not gonna say that part, they just want you to think that they've been living a busy life. Number five, and this one's a challenge too, I'd encourage you to try to single task. Multitasking is actually a myth. Walter Brueggemann says that multitasking is the drive to be more than we are, to control more than we do in order to extend our power and effectiveness. But such practice yields a self-divided self with full attention given to nothing. And so the next time you find yourself writing an email while you're, 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 you're scanning Twitter and while you're composing a text message and listening to music while talking to Sally over the cubicle wall or via Zoom or whatever the case is, um, I, I would just encourage you, I don't know about you, but like me, I wanna be someone who practices living in the moment who is fully present to the moment, fully present to God, fully present to my family, fully present to my work in the world, and fully present to my soul. Number six, if you can, I would say take a regular dog. This means day away with God. And um, church, your, your board and leadership has so graciously gifted each of the staff here at church with one of these every month. And it's kind of like a Sabbath, but it's also a little more, it's a little different. It's a 24-hour period where, yeah, you dive into a sacred pathway, but it's for the sake of, of hearing God's voice. It's for the sake of growing closer in your relationship with him. And I wish that every young mom could have one Saturday a month where they're able to leave the kids with the dad for an entire day and have one of these and vice versa. I wish there were people in this church who could provide that for a single parent every month to be intentional about slowing down. And number seven, this one was hard for me. If you can, take long vacations. I am the king of the two to three day trip, turnaround trip. It's like it's just so much extra work to be gone over the course of a weekend. So I'll just squeeze in a couple days here in Chicago or a couple days here in Washington or a couple days in Pine Top or whatever the case is, right? But a recent study in Finland at a university actually found that happiness levels don't peak until day eight of a vacation because it takes us that much time to kind of unwind and unplug from work. It peaks at day eight, and then it kind of plateaus. And so their encouragement at, the, at this university is, is actually, they recommend three times at least a year trying to take at least eight days or more of long vacations. Now, interesting note, um, the Hebrews back in the day, they actually had three festivals or three feasts a year that were kind of like extended Sabbaths. They were week-long Sabbaths where there was no work, no wanting, no worrying, right? Just extended Sabbaths. And since inevitably every seven days you would have a normal Sabbath mixed in, they actually came out to eight days, three times a year. 
Isn't it funny how sometimes science eventually catches up with the Bible? <laughs> now, I realize some of you may not have any vacation time. You're brand new in a job, or you're without a job, or you're trying to f your contract, or whatever the case is. And my suggestion would just be as long as you can and as frequently as you can to take a vacation. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Joel and Stuart are going to come um, help with a little song of reflection. And as they sing, it's just going to be a couple minutes, um, but I'm wondering if the rest of us, if you can grab something to write on, whether it's one of these highly addictive devices like I have, or whether it's a journal or, or a scrap of paper at home, uh, or wherever you're streaming online, if you can do this as well. If you have young kids, maybe even, I think it'd be so cool if you could explain this question and have a response from them as well. And the question that I want us to write down, if we can, in the next moment, or a, a response to, rather, is what is one way I can practice the unhurried rhythms of grace this week. This is our starting point. What is one way I can practice the unhurried rhythms of grace this week? Maybe it's applying one of these life hacks. Maybe it's stepping out in big faith and attempting a Sabbath. But as they sing, I encourage you, let's write that down and then I'll close this out. they're doing this just want to be rem reminded psalm chapter 46 verse 10 the words of god almighty he says be still and know that i am god and the word know there in the hebrew is the word yada it's the same word that is used in genesis which says that adam knew his wife and she became pregnant this is this experiential knowledge. This is not the kind of knowledge you get from reading a book. This is not the kind of knowledge you even get necessarily from reading your Bible. This is the type of knowledge that we can only find the experience of God when we slow down and stop.
something? Now here's the challenge. Whatever you wrote down, and I hope you did, if not, you may need some time to reflect on this later, I understand. But if the Lord gave you something, the challenge would be share that with someone. Share it with someone and ask them to encourage you in keeping that commitment this week. And if you have multiple family members, maybe even today at lunch, this could be something that you would talk about around the table. So I know this morning has been a little different pace. Um, I hope you found a moment just to breathe, a moment to rest. Let me pray for us. Father, I thank you. I thank you for who you are. I thank you that you are not nearly as complex as we have made ourselves. The invitation is simple. Come. Be still. And know that I am God. all to breathe. In the moment when life gets hectic, let us remember that you are the God of rest. I know some of us, God, are just honestly too busy not to stop. There's too much at stake. There's too much on the line for us to disobey your Sabbath. Again, just remembering that Jesus, the most influential person of all time, was never in a hurry, and he withdrew regularly to be alone with the Father, to observe the Sabbath, to lead those in close proximity around him in the same example. So I pray this morning that we would find rest for our souls, that we would remember what it is to be human beings and not simply human doings, that we may have the courage <laughs> sometimes to just stand there, don't do anything. I thank you that when we are obedient, God, that we fall into the natural order of the universe because that's how you created it. You created these lives with rhythm, with rest, and fruitfulness. God, thank you for these moments together. And I would even just extend, if there's anyone within the sound of my voice that has not taken that first step to come to Jesus, this is open for you. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. And this morning, maybe your soul craves some sort of peace, some sort of rest because your life is so hectic and chaotic. And maybe the first step this morning is to invite Jesus Christ into your life and begin a new journey. What Michael Todd would call the pace of grace, the unhurried rhythms of grace. And so if this is you this morning, I just ask, would you repeat this prayer just in the quietness of your heart? You're Jesus. Thank you that you are a God who slowed down. You are a God who died on a cross for me. This morning I confess that I'm a sinner, that I need something else. I need someone else. Jesus, would you be that someone else in my life? Lead me, guide me, encourage me, strengthen me, challenge me, 
Help me find rest for my soul. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, hopefully you feel rested and not like you just finished a funeral or something. Um, <laughs> but how appropriate on a Labor Day weekend to take a moment to rest from labor, from working, from worrying. As you go today and this week, I just my prayer is that you would feel the rest of God. Um, if you need any of the references for the million stats I used earlier, I can get those to you <laughs> later this week when I have a scheduled email time. Um, but otherwise, I think that's it, unless you had anything else to, to add on. Cool. Then we'll say have a great week, and our ushers will help dismiss us out from the back to the front. And thank you again for gathering outside as we uh, converse and still trying to hold to these standards. We love you guys. We continue to pray for you weekly as a staff and just want God's best in your life. So you are dismissed. <laughs>